welcome to a new episode of the brand called you today i have a very good friend a fellow ypo member and someone who i hold in very high esteem rajesh ralan welcome to the show thank you glad to be here thank you rajesh is uh, an mms from the university of mumbai like me he has attended various programs at ncat london business school wharton and harvard business school he serves on the boards of several uh, industry organizations he has worked for chiat financial aviva life pnb metlife and has now starting off his own healthcare insurance venture he's been an insurance professional for two decades and in his own words rajesh has been a startup executive and an entrepreneur all his life rajesh such an incredible career tell us a little bit about the early uh, part of your career and some of your successes your learnings and your challenges i think early part of my career was more about discovery i think you are finding yourself uh, you know in those days when you would get to mba after your graduation you mm-hmm. haven't spent much time working so you have straight away landed up in uh, you know a business school from your graduate school and i think that entire practical learning comes while you are at it so you are discovering in that phase so for me it was about uh, i wanted to do something of my own so i joined a packaging company initially and soon realized that uh, i could afford uh, the cost of machine uh, but nevertheless got into two innovations at that time mm-hmm. one was getting the small sachet of you know that you would have seen yeah. or packaging into uh, you know getting tea pack from card boxes to mm-hmm. laminates that's mm-hmm. what i got into initially soon realized that wasn't right then got into financial services i uh, joined cet financial and uh, Uh, i was put on the, uh, i was given a responsibility on the asset side realized that assets was in my forte and then i got into the liability side yeah. uh, got into uh, more of you know raising uh, you know the uh, money and raising on the liability side you could be in stocks mm-hmm. soon realized the stocks was in my forte got into fixed deposits and then moved on from there to mutual funds and then eventually got on to life insurance okay. So uh, I think it was a journey uh, when you keep discovering yourself as to what you like and uh, soon find uh, as to you know where you really fit in. And for me, it was a discovery phase, uh, and I realized that I fitted very well uh, on the financial distribution side. Okay, and that is where my career has been for the last many years. Okay, so now coming to uh, insurance, where you spent such a long time, um, for our young listeners and viewers. insurance is something which is very critical mm-hmm. but nobody knows enough about it so before we get into your own life mm-hmm. tell us about the different types of insurance i mean there is general insurance there is health insurance there is travel insurance there is life insurance mm-hmm. and i don't know and vehicle insurance mm-hmm. so tell us a little bit about the industry so broadly industry can be classified into uh, three broad uh, three buckets uh, one is life uh, insurance life would include uh, retirement as well a part of it uh, then there is general insurance it's a very wide word in india abroad it is called pnc property and casualty mm-hmm. uh, general in india would include uh, motor it would include uh, health it would include fire marine Uh, okay. anything to do with the commercial insurance is what comes into general insurance side mm-hmm. and now we have a separate category as per our regulations in india uh, which is health so health interestingly can be done uh, by general insurance companies as well mm-hmm. you would have heard all the old indian nationalized companies yeah. selling health insurance okay. uh, but we have a very robust sector now which has emerged uh, so broadly uh, that is how it is today how i see it in the future coming up is that as the market grows from here um, if it's a general insurance company they can either be a motor company or they can be a health company mm. or they can be a crop insurance company or they can be a weather insurance company mm. all packed into one may not be the model going forward and i think it's a question of uh, how uh, insurance industry grows how the products evolve how the need emerges and you would soon you could have companies which are only into e-commerce packets insurance mm. so it will evolve over a period of time mm. and uh, capital structure is different products are different distribution channels are different so i think though we have uh, now 2012 insurance was liberalized in 99 december 99 it's 20 years now but i would say the next 10 to 15 years we'll see 
focused insurance players in the market. Mm -hmm. So it's very interesting, you know, if you look at the insurance, you know, when I was growing up, it was always something the government did or the government owned companies did. And yet you say in 1999 or December 1999, the entire thing was opened up. Mm -hmm. What has changed that mm -hmm. has suddenly made top talent from the private sector mm -hmm. rush to something that was always public sector? So, uh, the traditional supplier of talent uh, for insurance have always been uh, insurance companies in the country. And broadly, they have been from general insurance. Mm -hmm. So, as you know that, uh, you know, a lot of uh, uh, professionals who would not want to get into UPSC and were in allied services mm -hmm. uh, would join uh, insurance, New India Assurance and other uh, uh, insurance companies. Uh, so we had very good talent that was nurtured all these years and uh, that was the talent which actually moved on to the entire general insurance industry. Mm -hmm. On the life side, there wasn't much that came in from LIC. Uh, what we got in early years were actuaries, uh, but we didn't see many distribution or uh, uh, you know the front end wasn't something that we got from the life insurance side. Mm -hmm. So it was the back office, you know, underwriters or uh, actuaries who came in from that. So there was a natural uh, glut or I would say lack of talent in this area. And when these new uh, companies came up, uh, they had to attract talent from financial services distribution industry. Mm -hmm. And for us, it was a natural uh, kind of a transition because, uh, you know, one had been on the, you know, seen FFDs and mutual funds and one had realized that mutual fund is actually a subset of uh, life insurance industry. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> it's a very interesting story and uh, I think maybe we'll talk some other day yeah, maybe yeah. on it. Yeah. But I can tell you that I, I actually picked up Malhotra committee of report, went on my own to London and met 20 companies, convincing them in 1998-97 to come to India. Yes. And, and I knew no one. Yeah. And I finally convinced one who actually hired me as their first employee and as a consultant in India. Mm -hmm. And that is how we formed a, a small project team. And finally, Old Mutual was a company that did JV with mm -hmm. Kotak. Mm -hmm. And I was amongst the first three employees to start that company. Yes. And then, of course, uh, you know, you moved on to be the managing director of MetLife India. Um, how important is life insurance for a young individual? You know, it used to be something very important in the old days, but are people, are young people, actually taking life insurance now? So I, I guess there are, uh, you know, when we focus on life, um, I think it's a question of. Uh, what do you want out of it? So, uh, of course, protection is important. When I say that a youngster is going to, you know, uh, take a house and mortgage and he's taking a huge liability on himself and tomorrow, God forbid, something happens to him, his family could be in trouble. Mm. So at that stage, I think life insurance is very critical for him mm. because he's the sole bread earner of the family. Okay. And if something goes wrong, uh, 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 at least, you know, there is a fallback option for the family not to be thrown out of the house that they, they, that they have mortgage. So, so when it comes to need, that becomes important. Mm -hmm. However, the growth of uh, uh, life insurance industry in India has largely been in the area of uh, savings, long-term savings. Yes. So there are very few options for youngsters to save, save for, let's say, 10, 15 or 20 years. I'm not saying that youngsters mm -hmm. are very good savers. Yeah. But at the same time, if you want to save for long term, life insurance is the only option mm -hmm. because Deposit rates would not give you uh, the, those kind of uh, long-term interest yes. rates. Yeah. Mutual funds definitely from three to five years of horizon, it's a very good option. Mm -hmm. But if you were to say for 10, 15, 20 years, uh, ULIP policies particularly uh, gave a good option to youngsters wherein they could save for the long term and they, and they would be having a minimal cover in that option. And if something happened, then you know the family would also get uh, insurance as well. So, you know, Rajesh, when you were building MetLife, um, and you started from scratch and you built it up into a major player. Um, what were some of the key challenges you faced? So MetLife was an existing company okay. when I joined. In fact, uh, my uh, first few years, as I mentioned, were all in startups. Mm -hmm. MetLife was a transformation story. Okay. So uh, MetLife had been in the country since 2001. Uh, there were 13 players and for some reason, MetLife always remained a 12th company for the first five, six years. They were doing very well as far as, you know, their plans were concerned. But it's like they were uh, on their plan, but the market was going at, you know, multiples of their plan. 
So question was that how could MetLife gain market share? And uh, they decided to change the management in 2006. And uh, I was 39 at that time and got an opportunity to, to head the company. So for me, it was a transformation. Uh, a transformation which involved not only you know, growing the company, but also making it profitable and also, you know, making the changes alongside mm-hmm. that one had to. So uh, it, it, it was a once in a lifetime opportunity that a youngster would get uh, to, to, to ensure. And I, and I can tell you that in no time, uh, we were the seventh largest company by 2010. By this time, there were 22 players in the market. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, we were doing pretty well in terms of getting market share. And, and company has consistently grown since then. Okay. And in 2012, we signed up with PNB, and that became PNB MetLife Insurance. Mm. Uh, you know, I was uh, you know, mm. uh, spearheading that yeah. uh, with, with the with the team, and you know, everyone played their part to get mm. that done. Mm. And today, as you see, the company is the seventh largest, and there are 24 players mm. in the market. Mm. And as happens in most sectors across, you know, whichever whether it's telecom or anything else or insurance. You expect to see consolidation happen? 24 players, aren't they too many? Yes, you're right. But currently, about uh, four companies, uh, the top four companies, have more than 50% market share. Sure. And uh, the balance, uh, you know, 17 companies, I'm not including government owned LIC into it. Well, in 17 companies uh, are, uh, you know, uh, I would say under 5% kind of a market share. So we have sub optimal players mm. in industry uh, with a sub optimal distribution and huge costs and capital deployed. Mm. So I guess uh, there are a few factors that have to uh, play in uh, before a consolidation really happens. Mm. Uh, the first one that I see is increase in FDI from 49 to 74% or 100%. Okay. When that happens, uh, you will have a lot many more foreign companies who would want to come in mm. uh, because there are very few Indian partners mm. who can deploy long-term capital for the next 5, 10, 15 years. In this industry, you need capital for 5 and 15 right. years. So uh, uh, there would be a lot more foreign players who would want to come now when they can uh, deploy that kind of long-term capital. That will be first trigger that I see. Mm-hmm. The second trigger I see is uh, if there is a company outside the country mm-hmm. uh, which gets taken over by another company and mm-hmm. they are present mm-hmm. in India, mm-hmm. that would lead to a Correct. consolidation. Correct. The third thing I see is that Indian partners not able to fund capital and Indian own private equity funds getting into it because you need a lot of Indian mm-hmm. capital. Uh, and there have been a few examples of late. A couple of uh, uh, insure, a couple of private equity players have taken stakes. Mm-hmm. Uh, that will also start changing the dynamics of the industry, mm-hmm. which could lead to consolidation. Okay. And uh, one last question on life before I move to your venture. What percentage of Indians are covered by life insurance? So I would say that in some form or the other, it's about 30 crore uh, individuals would be covered but that doesn't mean 30 crore policies because okay. policies could be much lesser but in the as you know corporates you have uh, group schemes yeah. as well yeah. so some form of insurance i would say is about 30 crores but that's that's also only about 25 percent of the country but i think question is not the number of people mm-hmm. insured okay. it's a question of uh, are they aptly and rightly insured okay so i think a lot of our indians are underinsured mm-hmm. so they have bought policies but it's a they have a policy but at the same time it does it cover their liability? Does it cover? Yeah. We would say that you know, uh, a person should buy life insurance at least, which is you know, five to ten times of their ten annual income. You know, it should be at least of uh, that size. Ten times of annual income, and, and because that's a replacement cost mm-hmm. of an individual, yeah, what a family would need. So five to ten times it could be anything in there. So that's a ballpark that I mentioned. But, but that has also changed. I mean, you know, I remember many years ago when I moved back from Singapore, mm-hmm. uh, that was before privatization. I had asked LIC to get me a 25 lakh insurance policy, and this was in 96. And they had to give one, take some special approval because they say if the body policy could be leaning. So market has changed a lot. So when a new industry or a new company starts, their underwriting uh, ability, capability, and strength is uh, you know may not be that high. As you would have seen in banking, you know we used to carry all our three-year balance sheet, mm-hmm. P&L financial statements to get loans, mm-hmm. but today you get it on a credit card. Yeah. So that was about loans mm-hmm. underwriting. So similar, similar thing is about an individual's underwriting as well. Correct. As you are able to understand risk, as you are able to price the risk 
as the capacity and underwriting capability of an insurance company increases mm. and they have the required solvency to back to pay the premium, to pay the claims, mm. their ability to take greater risk increases mm. very much. Right. So today, if you were to take a term insurance, one yeah. road, you can get it probably on online. Mm. Wow. Okay. That has changed. So, you know, Rajesh, you, after working for MetLife, you become an entrepreneur again. And you are now setting up your own health venture. Uh, supported by Sabre Partners. Tell us a little bit about this venture. So, uh, uh, you know, after MetLife and finishing my stint in Hong Kong, when I came back, I looked at the industry, I looked at life, I looked at non-life. Uh, within non-life, I looked at all the segments and realized that health was a growing segment. Mm -hmm. Within health, I looked at group health and I looked at retail health and realized that it was the retail health sector, which is one where one had to focus. Mm -hmm. Because that market is growing at 40% plus. Okay. So that's the fastest growing segment uh, in terms of the opportunity in the future. So today, I would say market is something like 42,000 crores, which includes the general and uh, standalone health insurers. Mm -hmm. Standalone health insurers are at about 18,000 crores. And 8,000 crores approximately is a new business premium, the rest is the renewals. Okay. And this is growing by 40%. So if this market, can, the way it is, and all projections state that it will continue to grow for many years to come. Mm. So that was a sweet spot that I decided to focus on. Right. And that's very interesting. I mean, you know, uh, I was reading some statistics that in the last 20 odd years, health insurance is now covering from about, I think the coverage was about 13 or 14 percent of India to now probably 24, 25 percent of India. And that you say is continuing to grow because the potential is large. I, my numbers could be wrong. You see, uh, we all talk about the India, Indian middle class, 30 crores. I think time has come for us to look at the next level of the middle class, which is the next 40 crores. So this 30 crores, I would say, has got access to anything and everything that we produce or we consume or we cover ourselves with. Mm -hmm. But I think we now start, start we've got to start thinking about right. the next 40 crores which is going to be the next tier of the middle class that's going to come in. And all our models that we have to create for the future, be it insurance or anything else, and we've seen the success of telecom in that, yeah. we have to create uh, products which we can deliver uh, at a cost which is affordable, mm -hmm. at a cost uh, which is you know acceptable and is, 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 is something that we can uh, deliver products to. Right. Mm -hmm. I, I, and uh, that is where I think we need to tailor our future models. Mm -hmm. And where does... Ayushman Bharat plug into this whole network of 50 crore uh, homes that will be supported? So, uh, I mean, I would call Ayushman Bharat as the national health scheme, mm -hmm. kind of, you know, the way we have created it. Uh, I think it's a great initiative by the government uh, because one, there's a need. We have seen, uh, I have seen a number of people slipping back into poverty because they cannot, uh, you know, pay the health expenses. Uh, we've seen people selling their land, their houses to, you know, just cover themselves up. So, uh, to pay for the health expenses. Uh, so, uh, this kind of a scheme definitely helps, you know, at least people who are e either below or just above mm -hmm. the poverty level. Mm -hmm. And any anybody and everybody who is around 5 lakh of income, I would say, will be greatly benefited mm -hmm. by this scheme. So I would say the scheme is still evolving. Mm -hmm. It is just recently being launched. It is still being understood. Mm -hmm. And there's still, you know, a lot of uh, teething trouble that we have in terms of, you know, uh, general claims coming in or people understanding the cost of it. There's a lot of averaging happening mm -hmm. in terms of certain medical conditions that are being treated. For example, maternity has mm -hmm. only 8,000 rupees and mm -hmm. you cannot do maternity in 8,000 rupees. So, so there are things like that. I'm sure that it will be going through a learning yeah. phase and it will change over a period of time. And which uh, area of health insurance are you focusing on? You did mention retail. Are you launching your own company? Health so, company? Uh, 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 you know, uh, as we uh, talked about, uh, so uh, it's not my company uh, that I am launching. Okay. Uh, it is, uh, uh, you know, an existing company, uh, existing health insurance company, okay. uh, where uh, one of the private equity partners okay. uh, has an option to uh, you know, invest in that company. Okay. And uh, I have been working with them closely okay. uh, to ensure that uh, we get this, uh, you know, uh, you know, this uh, venture going, okay. and uh, it would have some close, in, uh, you know, involvement in it. Well, good luck. Thank you.
I'm sure we'll hear much more about the venture and we'll get you back to talk about that at some stage. But let's come to uh, your journey as uh, a startup mm. entrepreneur. So let's talk, ask you a few questions about mm. your thoughts on startups because, you know, 15, 20,000 people watch or hear us every day. Mm -hmm. um, what are some of the basic mistakes a lot of startup entrepreneurs make? And in your case, you're a startup professional entrepreneur also. Let me take a step back. Sure. First of all, uh, I think it's, you know, everybody says entrepreneurs, uh, it's something that, you know, you, you feel about it, you want to be an entrepreneur, it's natural to an individual. Um, but I think uh, I have a few points on that, which is, it's not only about IQ, it's also about EQ, mm -hmm. it's also about CQ, okay. which I call as cultural quotient. It's also about FQ, which is food quotient. It's about TQ, which is travel quotient. So I think as a holistic development of an individual, if you've been around and seen around as to where you are and you understand, I think you have a natural sense to adapt or to become an entrepreneur. Because entrepreneurs naturally, you know, are, are not the people who are conditioned to a particular environment. They mm -hmm. have to be very flexible. They have to be adaptable. They have to evolve. They have to change. They, they should be able to move on to make what I call as corrective. Uh, uh, um, they have to be able to concurrently correct themselves mm -hmm. as they move forward mm -hmm. uh, to be on that path. So, as far as your question is concerned as to what were uh, my challenges as, as an individual when I started. I think the first challenge at that time that used to be uh, what, what people really face is they tend to recruit similar kind of people. So you see, uh, you know, startup entrepreneurs coming from the same dorm. Uh, they, uh, they, they have lived together. Uh, they, they, they understand each other. So this similar kind of people. So when, so there is, when they start a company, uh, Let's say there are two consultants who are coming from a consulting background. They will build a company with a fantastic back-end processes, but they will have no knowledge of sales. Mm. And, uh, or I will say they have little knowledge of sales. And then the respect that is required to bring in, bring in a plain graduate to complement the team doesn't exist. Yeah. Because they're coming from office backgrounds, they're mm. from you know, premier institutes. So I think the critical thing is about developing a team that has got compatibility, bring in, in a team that's got complementarity bringing in strengths that doesn't exist with the existing team mm -hmm. and respecting it. Mm -hmm. So this is a theme I have seen across. So when I see tech entrepreneurs, uh, I'm, I'm invested in one of the companies and I sit on the board as well. And uh, when I see them, excellent product, everything, but at the same time, you know, they need to bring in more people for business development because that skill naturally doesn't exist mm -hmm. in those individuals. So and they understand it. Mm -hmm. So there are people who do not understand and there are people who really want to understand and learn from others' experiences. Mm -hmm. So I think the key challenge that I have seen is building a team that is complementary, okay. uh, that brings in strengths required to build a company. Okay. Very interesting. I mean, what you're really saying is that it's one, it's always good to have a partner and have a partner with complementary skills. That's right. Okay. So next question, I mean, I ask a lot of my guests this question, and you know, um, I've done startups, you've done startups, we also know how many startups fail. Mm -hmm. And more particularly in India, we have never been taught the importance of understanding failure. As a result of which, more very recently, we saw an extreme step being taken by a very, very prominent entrepreneur. How important is uh, it for us to teach our startup ecosystem that it's not bad to fail. Uh, I think it's a it's a very very good question because till fifty years of my age, even I hadn't realized that. Because once you're doing well in your life yeah. and you are, um, you know, on a 40, 50, 45 degree graph, uh, you haven't seen failure okay. yet. So when it happens and it strikes you, I think that's the time different people deal differently with failure. Okay. I wouldn't say that there is some kind of a training that needs uh, uh, to be given to people to fail. But yes, I think taking it on your chin and moving on or to say that, you know, uh, yes, uh, if you want to fail, you fail early, mm -hmm. you learn early and you go for your next success. Yes. But I think it's easier said than done. Mm -hmm. When it hits you, I think how one deals mm -hmm. with it and that I think only an individual can deal with it rather than anybody training a person to do it. Mm -hmm. I mean, that would be my experience. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, I have seen that in the last three, four years. It's not been easy. Mm -hmm. and, but it's like, you know, you're digging a gold mine. You have to keep digging it. Correct. 
because you don't know when the last stone that you're digging in the gold lies is behind you. And if you stop, stop digging, you'll have to dig another mine. So it's you have to be in it and you have to be persevering yeah. uh, to make sure that you succeed at the I end agree. of it. I agree. I agree. So Rajesh, coming to the last part of our show, which is a few questions to you personally. Mm -hmm. um, when was the last time you did something for the first time? I guess uh, I'm a person who keeps trying new things always. So uh, I'm very optimistic about doing things. So uh, anything new. So the last new thing that I've done is that I'm now working with 25 and 24 year olds. Fantastic. And I'm doing something in AI and I'm doing and working in insure tech uh, because I know that's critically important in times to come. Uh, because when you know this venture gets started, you will need the new age technology to take it to the next 10 or 15 years. So I'm training myself for that. And I've been working with techies for the last one and a half years. Okay. So I think it's very exciting uh, to get into something new, understanding their way of thinking, how they do stuff, mm. and how they how they plan stuff. Mm. It's very different. So, and it's a big learning. And working it's a big with learning. Yeah. I think movie intern was a good uh, you know, orientation to really get into it. Absolutely right. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, you say that uh, you are a networker and you nurture relationships. Mm -hmm. uh, help me understand this comment and then also tell me how important is networking mm -hmm. in all our lives. We Everyone's talking about it, mm -hmm. but I don't think people really understand mm -hmm. how to mine a network. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts? So I'll take the second question first, okay. which is, uh, I think apart from financial capital, what is also important is social capital. It's also important is resource capital. And time, uh, and it's always been there. It, it's it's not something that uh, I'm speaking something very new. I may be putting some words to it, mm -hmm. but I think you have to add social and resource capital to it because uh, uh, in uh, you, you know you cannot be working in isolation. And when you are working with people, uh, you have to realize that there is ultimately a human at the back who's taking decisions. Sure, it's critically important for a human to have a human relationship with another person to understand where the person comes from, how much can you be trusted, how much you can be, you know, uh, uh, you know, be, be involved with them to build something with them together. Mm -hmm. So I think that a lot is dependent on the trust that you build with people. And I think that only comes in through communication, mm -hmm. which is key to relationship. Okay. So I would say that, uh, hence relationship is critically important. Mm -hmm. So nurturing, I think is again, you know, uh, everyone has their own way of linking up. I call it commonality. Okay. So unless and until you have a commonality between people, it's very hard to maintain relationship. You see uh, young moms who go to school and drop kids uh, and the kids are in the same class, they become friends mm -hmm. and they have something in common. You see people who play together, golfers, they become friends, there's something in common. Similarly, there'll be guys who play cards and there mm -hmm. are people like us who may not be doing, who may or may not be doing some of these things, but find commonalities with people okay. to nurture relationships. So as long as you can find those commonalities and create uh, you know, genuinely believe that you are adding and contributing to those. Mm -hmm. I think you build great relationships. That's well said. Very well said. So there's two more questions for you. One question that I ask all my guests, because a lot of our people think that people, people like you who have achieved a lot have had no failures. So I, I ask all my guests, tell me your learnings from some of your failures. So, um, I think, uh, one of the things that I uh, I have learned is that uh, don't take anything for granted. And we are in a very, very uh, transient world. Uh, everything is changing very fast. Things may not happen because of you, but things may happen to you because of something that changes externally. I think it's the ability to deal with it, uh, which is extremely important. So uh, never ever rely on one client who's very large is what I've learned. Uh, I've seen 50% of my business walking out one day after you built a great company, mm. not because we did anything wrong, but because of some external situation that emerged. Okay. So that's been my biggest learning. Never take, like I said, you know, for granted that mm. that business would stay with you. Mm. So how you are able to, you have to actually diversify, not being dependent on them. That's one of my learning. Second is that when, uh, you know, something like that happens, uh, most people uh, would be, you know, reacting to such situation. I think you need to be absolutely calm because that's the time when people are looking at you as a leader how do you react to that situation so i think dealing with that failure and letting people know that you are there for them i think is is, is a 
uh, most important thing because that's the time they really need your leadership at that stage. Mm-hmm. So I think that's one thing I've learned that how you can become a better leader right. in times of failure. I think uh, uh, that that is uh, uh, you know uh, been uh, one of the things that I've seen. So my last question to you: you know, you've been a professional manager, you've been a successful entrepreneur, you're still on an entrepreneurial journey. For for a 20, 21 year old who's starting off life um, and has 30, 40 years of career ahead of them, any advice to them? Uh, You know, it's like, it's a debate we all have at our homes as well. Because we all have children growing up in that age. So it's very easy to advise. But I guess people uh, do want to, you know, make their own mistakes and learn. It's very hard. Uh, to give any kind of a set path to anyone that which is going to work out because it, it worked out for you in the past it doesn't work uh, that way so my advice is that uh, you know you have to be first of all focused in terms of what you want to do uh, if you don't have focus and you're faltering around I don't think you'll get anywhere you want to second thing is once you you got your focus and attention on something that you want to do uh, it, it's important where does it lead to so what's your goal? What's the purpose for what, which you're working? I think you have to get on to the second side of that, which is where are you heading towards? And third is persevering that, making sure that what you have decided now, you go on it un- unstinted with a, with a single-minded, what I call it, Arjun's, you know, yeah, I, I, yeah. I, I, I am the ball. <laughs> yeah, I <laughs> you know, the fish. yeah, you have to have that. Correct. Focus completely on that. Right. And uh, uh, you, you have to be at it unless something happens. So I always say, make this statement and say, there are only three things that can put you down. One is God, you know, power. Yeah. Second is your own health. And then third is your own motivation. Yeah. There are only three things you can, which is you yourself, yeah. the third piece, yeah. that can put you down. There's nothing else that, that should be able to put mm-hmm. you down. Mm-hmm. So I think you should walk unstinted on that path as long as you, you would want to make things happen. Mm-hmm. Fantastic. That's a great way to end. Only three things can put you down. God, health and your own motivation. Rajesh, thank you very much for coming on the show. It's been fantastic speaking to you and your words of wisdom will, I'm sure, ring true with lots of people who are hearing this. Thank you, Ashutosh, for having me. Thank you for listening to the Brand Called You podcast. Be sure to visit tbcy.in to join the conversation, access show notes, and discover fantastic bonus content. You can follow us on YouTube, Twitter, Facebook and Instagram. Simply search for The Brand Called You. Thank you and see you next week.